Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with custom knife maker, David Longworth. Let me just preface this all by saying, David's work is way above my pay grade, and not just in terms of exclusivity, but sophistication. Nonetheless, his type of knife is what I aspire to someday have in my collection. His folders are functional, capable, and even innovative, but the craftsmanship and the artistry it takes to design and create such stunning and different folding knives transcends knife and maker. I met David and saw his work and handled it at Blade Show 2021, and it blew me away. And this is all now according to me. His work approaches art, uh, but according to me, can never actually be art because it performs a practical function, uh, meaning it cuts, which to me makes it even better than art. Okay, I've gone on too long. In any case, his sublime creations bring him here, and I'm really excited to speak with David Longworth about his knives. But first, if you think what we do here is valuable and you want to help support the show while enjoying exclusive content and more, you can do so on Patreon. The quickest way to get there is to head over to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Ever start looking for your next knife purchase before your last purchase has even arrived? Then you're probably a knife junkie. Hello, David. Welcome to the show. Hi, Bob. Hey, uh, so, okay. Uh, I met you at, uh, in Atlanta at Blade Show 2021, and I was uh, kind of trawling around, and I saw your knives, and, and your table jumped out at me. And a lot of it had to do with the, um, well, uh, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, the Art Deco look, kind of like you have a, um, some of your work, some of your folding knives have a look uh, of kind of of a different era. Um, so tell me about your work a little bit and what your design inspirations are for these folders. Well, the first design inspiration is form follows function. Like you were saying before, the knife has to function. It has to be sharp. It has to move and feel right in a person's hand. Um, it's great that it's pretty, but, uh, you know, function is first. So that's, that's where I start with, uh, designing a knife. I mean, um, I've done some pretty wild creations, but again, they fit the hand, they work, they cut, that, that has to be. That was something that I noticed about your work. Uh, as soon as I picked it up is, uh, I tend to like really, you know, sturdy quote unquote overbuilt, uh, folders and yours, uh, were, you know, kind of dazzled me with their look. But then when I picked them up, I realized, uh, there, there was something serious under the hood. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, you uh, tend to tend towards innovation. And now I'm talking about the lock that we see right here in this picture up here. Uh, tell me about that lock and how you came about it. That is, um, I've named that my rock back. It, it's a takeoff from a lock back. Uh, because it's actually similar to it, uh, works in a similar way, but the uh, the release is right above the blade pivot on the back spine of the knife. Um, I did a lot of research, and after I designed that knife, and it worked out nice and worked the way I wanted it, I looked for other people doing it, and I couldn't see anybody had done it. You know, that's always a consideration when you design something. Yeah. Two people can independently design the same thing. It it does happen. Um I don't think anybody's ever done this before, so I do believe it's unique. Um, it's also simple and strong. And I'll tell you what, if you're going to design something, simple is tough. It's easy to design something really complex. Very, very easy. Um, to build it gets hard, and then it, it, it becomes less and less functional, maybe less and less strong. Simple mm -hmm. is strong. This is the way it works. So you're talking about... This design right here. Uh, this is a pretty good size folder. And the lock release 
is this button right here. Push it down, and the blade unlocks. And here it click. Maybe I don't know yeah. on your video. Oh yeah. Click, and you push it down with your thumb, and it shuts like a like a lock back would, right? It springs oh, shut, yeah. just like it. Um, but it, it's a it's a very robust lock. Um, I like everything about it personally. I got some input from some pretty good knife people at the blade show, as a matter of fact, that uh, questioned the button being maybe in, in, in the way if you're wanting to do this. And I, and I get that. That that makes good sense to me. Um, future designs, that button will probably come down a little bit because it really doesn't have to be that tall. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's a large button, which I do like. I don't like little tiny things that you try to push. It needs to be yeah, thumb yeah. size to me. You know, your thumb fits on that. So that's the rock back design right there. Yeah, you don't want to be digging around with the with the fattier thumb. Some people have bigger thumbs anyway. You you don't want to be guessing about that. Uh, that's interesting about the uh, the thing about the placement of the button, though. It seems that if you're using it the way you would use it, it's going against um, it's going against the the edge. So even if you happen to contact it with your thumb, it's never going to disengage it because you're cutting against the lock. Right. It's also a, a it's a deep push. It goes about mm -hmm. a hundred thousandths of an inch from locked to unlocked. So there, there's a, there's a long stroke on that. It's not a real tiny thing. There's a lot of, a lot of room there. And I've used this knife. This particular is the, the prototype of the rock back. This is the first one I did. Hmm. I did a lot of use on this one and tried it out. And I, I guess I don't tend to do that a lot. Um, all other forms of using this knife that I tried holding it, however you want to hold it, this button really never got in my way. But I, I do get their their point, and I'm probably going to work a little bit out of that, maybe drop that down quite a bit, which I, I've actually already designed that out of it. But um, real easy, smooth to push, locks itself, shuts nicely. Okay, all right. So let's talk about the 800-pound gorilla in the room, which is we're talking about practical, we're talking about robust locks and such. Yeah. But you were holding up this beautiful mammoth ivory knife with these little gold studs for pulls on the blade and this fantastic blade. So I, we're we're talking about two different worlds here, aren't we? Innovative and strong, and then artful and I mean, look at that. I mean, that thing is. Uh, that's an amazing, that's an amazing piece with some very exotic materials. Tell, how did you get involved in this and, and how did you get it to this level? I've been making knives for, um, more than 40 years. So low production. I never made a lot of knives. I've always had a, a full-time job. Um, but I've always been interested in knives. How, how did I get there? Well, if, if you want me to go back, I got there by my first knife was a lockback folder. And oh, that wow. is just one ugly little crocodile, trust <laughs> me. I know. This, this is based on a buck 110. And yeah, it was it made is. in the 1970s, late 70s. Um, but that's a completely handmade knife, and it functions, and it still locks to this day. Ugly, right? <laughs> and the evolution of that was... My next lockback folder looked kind of oh, like yeah. this. So I'm getting a little better, right? Mm -hmm. This one I carried for years. Uh, you can see the blade has actually been ground away quite a bit from repeated sharpenings. Uh, so this is a definite user knife. Um, probably about the uh, 1980s, I started doing things like this. Uh, let me get this in the right plane here. I don't know if you can see that for the glare very well here. It looks kind of like so this, Mother of Pearl. and So it's Mother of Pearl. It's stainless steel frame. It's all uh, intricately milled frames for the pearl, no liners, um, file work. And it's it's just another lockback. So this is the evolution of my lockbacks. Probably around the mid-'80s, I started making button locks too. 
I really like the button lock. Um, again, it's about placement where you release it. To me, a button lock, you know, on the side of a knife, like if that's the button on that knife, mm -hmm. it's right where I want to put my finger to release a knife. Oh yeah. Um, to me, that's, that's actually is the perfect place, but there's, there's a lot of technical, technical issues with doing it that way, but I've done a lot of those. Um, so after that, I was doing things like little pearl. That's uh, black mm. mother pearl silver. This one actually has an opal inlaid into the. So at holster. this at this yeah, stage, okay. at this stage of your work, it's starting to approach jewelry, right? You start with this yep. this one ten, which, by the way, I applaud your jimping. This was the seventies, and you're putting jimping on and. And uh, not that it didn't exist in the 70s, but it probably wasn't as big as it is it, uh, right now. I don't think it was called that either. <laughs> <laughs> it was right. It's called texturing for your thumb. Um, yes. So, it, but at this point, uh, with the last little folder you showed, you're 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 getting more sculptural and more. Um, I guess the evolution before that, you started upgrading your materials and getting into more exotic materials. Here, it looks like you're getting more sculptural, which is something I see in your current folders, especially the ones that are um, the uh, the geometric kind of ones. Um, so, how how did this how does this happen as a knife maker? Uh, do you do you just start progressing through materials or? Well. I don't actually like, I mean, I've heard a lot of knife makers brag about you can always recognize my knife. Mine really aren't that way. I change designs so much. If you look at what you've got on your screen right there, each knife seems to be quite a bit different than the other. And the yeah. ones on my workbench today don't look like those either. Hmm. Um, so I don't really stick to designs. There's too many good designs out there. I like to change. I really do. I'm constantly changing my designs. Um, you know, don't get me wrong. I'll go back and I'll make some others like, like I've got. Uh, but sometimes I want to do something different and, and I keep progressing that way. I like, I like to challenge myself. Honestly, I like to challenge with new designs. It's harder. Mm -hmm. It's easy to take your pattern out and scribe out, you know, 10 of these and do them. Um, it's harder just to redesign something and, maybe just do two of them because you don't want to make too many because you might mess up a whole bunch of them at once. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 Would, would you say that, um, would you, would you say that it takes at least a few specimens of each design to get it to its, its peak of build oh, yeah. or. Oh yeah. 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 Um, you know, um, if, even if I just do four knives, uh, the fourth knife will be, different in in some ways than the than the first one yeah. I, I can't i can't help it 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 will evolve uh just because i see things on each one i finish and uh the next one i'd like to maybe take this out and do it a little differently or something so yeah um a good example this is the prototype again mm -hmm. um it's it's fine i like the blade shape um it's got finger grooves which which i like um but I, I evolved. This is the, the fourth one of this version. I don't know if you can oh, see yes. the, the finger grooves went away. Uh -huh. um, and the entire knife actually got slimmer. I started deciding that I wanted a, a slimmer knife. So if you actually physically measure these two, I'm not going to hold them up. It's hard to do that way. Sure. But the, um, this knife is quite a bit slimmer than the prototype. The handle is, it, it's got a little better weight to it. And, um, so yeah, they they change. Almost each knife changes a little, and evolves. So so this model in particular that you're talking about, what is what is the name of this? The the lock is the rock back. Um, the rock, but but this particular folder, this drop point that you've been holding up, uh, you uh, hold you held up two iterations of that. What what is that called? I would call it my large fighter. You, oh, okay. That's right. The, I remember seeing the gold fighter on your website, right? Yeah. This, this being the gold fighter, because it's got a lot of 18 karat gold on it. Um, this is the prototype fighter because it's the first one. Got another one that's all stainless. I call the stainless steel fighter just, just to kind of differentiate, you know, and I can 
talk about them that way. Gotcha. All right. So before, when you were holding up the first uh, prototype of the Gold Fighter, I believe it was, uh, you mentioned how um, you've kind of had this around for a while, and you put it through its paces to sort of oh, yeah. test out the lock and 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 that kind of thing. I mean, to to me, owning this knife would be a great you know honor, and it would be something that I would safely keep snuggled away and i and i suspect a lot of people not everyone who has your knives um guard them because they're beautiful works but what kind of paces do you put them through that i wouldn't be able to if i owned that knife what kind of things do you do with that knife um to to make sure it's a good knife um uh, you know the the process of building the knife i go through an awful lot just as i'm building it like I've got a, a Rockwell hardness tester that I make sure that the blade is to the hardness that I want. Um, for example, this is San Mai, and it's the first time I made San Mai. Uh, it's 416 stainless on the blade with a 1075 carbon steel core. Um, I cut a whole bunch of test pieces because I'd never heat treated anything like that. And they, they, um, when, when this steel gets really hot and cools down, it moves at different rates and it can tear itself apart. And I experienced some of that. I actually had some of the steel split on me until I got my heat treat down. So uh, testing is as you're making it, you make sure you're making it correctly. You, you go through a long process of making sure your heat treat is exactly where you want it to be. Um, and to, to test it is using, I, you put it in your pocket and you carry it and you open Amazon boxes with it. You know, that's what, whatever you do with, you need a knife, you use it. All right. That's, that's my test. So, uh, just in looking at the, uh, the, the, what's the squared off knife that looks kind of like a straight razor. I, I call this, uh, my trapezoid design. Trapezoid. That's what it was. I'm terrible yeah. at geometry. That's why I couldn't remember the name. But two two parallel sides and two sides that are not parallel. So let me let me open this up. So if you look at the handle, um, narrow and gets thicker toward the blade, and these the the two ends are um, parallel lines, and then the the blade of course is. Also a parallel line. There, there is a lot of geometry that goes into this knife. Yeah. God. That, okay. So uh, we were just looking at pictures of it, and to me, I'm like, that is a, a villain's knife. I mean, uh, not, and I don't mean that in a, I mean that in a great way. It's a very cinematic kind of knife to me. It looks like something, uh, you know, uh, some sort of gangster from, from the twenties would carry or something. Um, and yet it, it also looks incredibly practical. Tell me about this model and what, you know, what went into it, what, what's behind it. I know it's got a special little bit of an opener. What's that all about? Another innovation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's not my innovation at all. Neither is the button lock. This is a button lock. Um, like I said, I've been doing these since the 1980s button locks. Uh, this actually just has a long, flat plate for a button. I mean, mm -hmm. normally you say button lock, you think of a little round thing, but it doesn't obviously have to be. Um, you push this plate, and the knife pops open. Let me do that again. Yeah. So it locks closed. It's got just a light spring on it. Oh, you push the God. plate, and it pops open just enough that you can put your thumb on this protrusion and bring the knife around to open. That is so. So, so cool. this is a this is a one hand knife. Yeah. I don't know if you can hear the lock on there, but it's oh yeah, pretty, yeah. It's a pretty pronounced click click. It locks open, locks closed. Uh, it's called a California opener, and again, I did not invent that. Other people do that. Other people do a button lock. I don't know if they do it like I do or not. Uh, this is my own version of it. If you look on the back side of this knife, this little polished round piece of hardened 440c mm -hmm. is the actual lock pin itself oh. so the lock pins on one side and the lock release is on the other side on this knife um all hidden hardware no screws uh, they're all internal it takes special tools to disassemble it 
Um, I don't know if you can see it or not, but if you look at that lock button right there, yeah. it's now up. And when I close the knife, oh, <laughs> yeah, that is so cool. It in, it engages about forty thousandths of an inch. Uh, again, everything internal on this knife is in, in all my knives. I, I use four forty C hardened stainless steel bushings, um, pivot pins screws, lock parts, everything's hardened. Everything's done right where I think it needs to be. Even the frame on this is 416 and it's hardened, yeah. which you can only get 416 so hard, but it's, it's pretty tough after you heat treat it. It doesn't scratch easily. It, it, it's more corrosion proof, all that. And this, um, this particular blade too is a first for me, speaking of innovations, I don't know if you can see it very well, but it is a Damascus. Yes. And it is a stainless steel Damascus, which is absolutely a first for me and was really tough to do. Um, so you forge your own steels? Yes. Okay. All right. So, I mean, we're, we're getting deeper. And de so this is what your knives look like after 40 years. Uh, and I'm curious what they're going to look like after another 40. I mean, because they are getting, they get m more ornate and more uh, um, fine and more detailed, it, it seems, from just the, the smattering you've shown. Um, uh, uh, okay, so let's let's get to the forging part. So, so what's, tell me why you forge your, your steel and why, you know, it seems like it might be more convenient to buy some, but do you, do you find more artistic control in forging it? Tell me about that. It would be way easier to buy my own. Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't normally do things the easy way. Um, it would be easier to buy steel from somebody else who does it all the time. Uh, you can buy it at decent prices. But I really like the idea of doing it all, doing everything. I don't know. It's just there's something about it. Um, I want to make every part of this knife. I want full control over it. Um, I want to make my own steel. I'm even starting to make my own screws. Mm -hmm. I can buy screws for a buck or two a piece. And if you look at it from a pure business point of view, it makes no sense to make your own screws. But I want to make every single part of this knife, any knife I make, it's going to be all done by me, all handmade. Um, no CNC or anything like that. It's all handmade. Okay. I, Why? Good. That's a good question. <laughs> um, it gives me full control, which I like. Um, it gives me, you know, if, if I decide there's not a lot of people making, uh, CMP 154 ABEL Damascus stainless steel. Ooh. So, you know, those are really good steels in my opinion. And you mix them together. That is a tough blade yeah. right there. Yeah. It's a tough piece of metal. Um, I can do things like that. I can, um, I can start being really creative on my steels. I I've got some ideas of where I want to go next. I'm out of the last batch I forged and here in a, a month or so, I'm going to start forging some more stuff, and I'm just full of neat ideas. So it, it's, it gets me excited more than calling somebody up and say, hey, mail me a piece of metal. Right, and it's a creation from the very ground level up. I mean, you can't get more granular uh, than making your own screws and your own blade steel. Now, the blade steel you said here was a CPM 154 and AEBL That's stainless correct. Damascus. Wow. Yep. So uh, I, I would imagine there is a lot of uh, just stabbing around, excuse the pun, uh, trying to figure out how to how to do that, I would imagine. Yeah, and it's, it's very difficult. It's way harder than forging carbon steel. Um, I've got several other knives here that are, you know, Damascus carbon steel, and um, I haven't done a lot of it, but it wasn't too bad. And there's a lot of online information. Of course, I take act, I take advantage of whenever I can. And I, you know, I study up. There's lots of good stuff out there, unlike it used to be years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but there's almost nothing on stainless steel Damascus. And it, it turns out that the, the heating, the temperature range to forge stainless steel is a real small window that you have to absolutely adhere to 
or you will just, it'll just crunch into chunks and tear itself apart. Um, I know because I've got a whole box of uh, garbage steel to make that blade. I ruined a lot of steel and spent a lot mm. of money, but I have some ideas on how to do it now. So I'm moving forward and that's, that's my goal all the time is to learn and get better. And that that's one of them. Do you, do you consider your work uh, art knives? I don't know if that's actually a, a thing, but I mean, to me, your, your knives are, are um, you know, obvious. It's, it's obvious. You don't have to be a knife expert to look at your knives and then say, look at the knives in my collection and know that they're, they're different things. You know, uh, yours are very, uh, get extreme attention by, by one maker soup to nuts, uh, including design and, and toil and love and, and all of that. Um, how do you consider them art knives? I mean, what, who, who buys your knives and uses them? How does that work? Um, well, like I said before, I, I consider my knives functional. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they look good. I do a lot of work to get there, but they, at the end of the day, they are sharp tools. Um, if you want to carry them in your pocket, it, let me give you an example. I don't know if you can see this little knife, but this is a carved bolsters, little lockback, little tiny thing, abalone handles, just a real sparkly pocket jewelry. Yeah. This is my wife's knife. If she's somewhere, she pulls this out and uses it. So there's, there's nothing wrong with that. They're, they're using knives at the end of the day. I mean, a lot of people will buy them and they'll put them in their pouch and they'll slide them in a drawer and they will never use them. I know that for a fact. Yeah, yeah. But I've got other people that will bring a knife out and say, hey, Dave, here's that one you made for me 10 years ago. And I look at it and it's just scratched up and beat up. And <laughs> it's been used, but it still works. Yeah. So as the maker, do you have any preference as to what you'd rather see? Would you rather see your pristine work, you know, 15 years down the road, never having cut a thing or, or would you love to see something pocket worn and pulled out? And, uh, you know, I think, I think a little of both, maybe every other one that I see after 10 or 20 years, I'd like to see some that have been used and some that are still sparkling because, you know, um, they started out really pretty. And once, once they get pocket worn, they, they don't look quite the same. <laughs> yeah. Well, so you, you indicated before that you've always had a full-time job while doing this. Um, how does that, uh, what, whatever that job is, how does that feed into what you do? And, and is, is making knives a respite, uh, or, or is it, um, you know, are, are they, hand and glove well what i've done over the years for employment has really helped me in the in the knife field um i've been an industrial electrician um i've been a uh, a, a technician i've done computer setups i've done hydraulic troubleshooting um i've operated all kinds of software um so, so I did mechanical, electrical, hydraulic, and, and computer work, right? I was a, a technician traveling around the world working on um, really expensive machinery, big, expensive industrial stuff. Hmm. Uh, you know, I've been in hundreds of factories around the world. But, but all that knowledge, when it came time to build a hydraulic press, I'm like, yeah, well, sure, 30 ton, I need a the size motor and I just sketched it out and I went and bought the stuff and I welded it all together and, and it, I make steel now, right? When I, when I need a grinder, there are some fantastic grinder manufacturers out there, uh, but I'm going to build my own. I'm sorry. I, I like my grinders. Yeah. Yeah. How cool is that? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I worked with variable frequency drives. So I put, you know, speed control on my grinders and all kinds of things like that. Um, build my own electrical anodizers and, you know, uh, again, I like full control over everything, I guess. So what is it 
about knives. Why, why knives? Um, you know, there's a, and I've always had it since a kid, since a, you know, a, a young, young kid. Um, my dad collected guns and I, I'd travel around to, to gun shops with him. And, you know, I was exposed to a lot of knives, um, I've carried pocket knives my entire life since a kid. Um, there's something I think deep primordial. It's a feeling you get when you handle a knife. Um, there's something I think we, none of us really understand about how we feel about knives. I think there's something, you know, maybe in our genes or I don't know. I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's deep. <laughs> yes. I, 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 I just, I've just always really liked them. They, they, they just do it for me. I don't know. Well, it seems like, I mean, the reason I ask is like, you know, obviously you have the resources with all the past jobs you've had, you know how to make tools to make other things. Um, you know, you could be making wrenches or hammers or bicycles right now, but you chose knives. It's, it's interesting to me uh, because I, like you, believe that there's something way deeper you know, than, yeah, it was our first tool and that's where it starts. And we know how tool obsessed we are. You know, yeah. so there's something really, really deep about it. And, um, you know, there's a, obviously you have gotten to the point in your career, if, if you ask me, where you're pursuing beauty as well. It's not just function. Function is a given. Function is baked in. But you're, um, you know, you're pursuing a, a, a beauty in your work and you're, you're taking your time and you're not throwing, it's like, in in a sense, since you're not having to sell these knives because you have another job, in a way, you can be as artful as you want. Well, to be honest with you, things have changed for me recently. I've always had a, a full-time job, but I retired as of August the 1st. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Dave Longworth is, a, yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's, it was a lot of work getting to this point, right? Um, I never made a lot of knives and, and like I said, I traveled for years and when you travel, you don't, you don't make knives. Yeah. So there was years of that. So I'm, I'm kind of back into knives, but in a really serious way. And I, I decided several years ago, I was going to retire and make knives because I've always wanted to do that. And now, now I'm doing it. So it's, it's a full-time job for me. Um, you know, I'm comfortable. I like doing it. It's, it's, it's pleasure. So it feels really good. Well, man, congratulations. You got an encore career making some seriously beautiful knives. So a uh, question for you. It, so when I speak with um, fixed blade knife makers or people who are kind of exclusively fixed blade makers, I, I always get to the point where I ask about the pressure of folders because uh in this day and age, you know, folders are where it's at, so to speak. And um, so I think that that some fixed blade knife makers feel a pull towards that. Some might feel pressure. You're a folder maker. Do you feel a pressure towards production? Pro you know, hooking up with a production knife company and licensing and, all, and doing all of that. Is that a natural outcropping or outgrowth of being a folder maker or not? when you're making folders like this? I, I don't think it has to be. I, I know a lot of people do and it, it's, it's hard to do what they do. I, I get it. You know, I've worked in factories. I know how hard it is to mass produce things, but I don't really want to do that. I want to, um, I want to make a few knives, but really, really well. I want to innovate. I want to make stuff that nobody else does. That's really my goal. Um, I don't want to copy people. I, I, I want to make stuff that's, that's unique to the, to the knife field. If, if everybody's doing a certain kind of knife, I'm going to look around and say, nobody's doing this. Let's, mm -hmm. let's try this. There, there's a niche market over here that I, I think maybe I would fit in. And that's kind of my goal here is just to have a small piece of the market. I don't want a big slice of the pie here i don't need it 
that leads me to materials your materials the materials you use like i mentioned before gold bronze titanium obviously really cool uh damascene steels uh you know that's a that was a great uh stainless combo you mentioned earlier um mammoth ivory m like I don't have anything with mammoth, mammoth ivory, but to me, that is like the dream material right there. All these other uh, exotic materials you use, um, do you derive a certain sort of pleasure out of working with those fine materials? Uh, is, it, is it something in how they feel when you're working with them, or is it the end product? It, it is. There's, there's definitely a feel with working mammoth ivory. Um, trying to work that material down to leave that, you know, 40,000 year old surface texture on there, you know, the, the nice stuff. Um, there, there definitely is. I've just recently started working with gold and, and absolutely love it. It's, I mean, I, I can't afford to work with much of it, but it's, it's malleable and it works very nicely. And if you're, if you're worth, used to working with, you know, 440c stainless steel and things like that you get a little gold in your hands and you can just peen it around it it just kind of <laughs> shapes it feels like working butter after some of the tough space age materials we use today so yeah i i, I love the materials um i like titanium a lot it's it's a really neat material um i love stainless steel still i really do i used to use a lot of stainless steel in my knives and i, I still like it i mean there's a place for it it really is. Uh, just hearing you talk about the materials and working with them. My, my mother makes jewelry and um, she's always made really beautiful stuff. And uh, one thing about it is the materials they have. She works with such a wide variety of materials and um, it, it seems as if your work or it's kind of inevitable for people who are making kind of art, art knives that they tend towards i mean in a way this is when people talk about pocket jewelry this is pocket jewelry yeah yeah um i i, I love the materials i love the combinations yeah. of materials and textures um i was talking about stainless steel i'd like to show you this one if i could oh yeah i love all metal knives there is just something about yeah. an all an all metal knife. Now this is all stainless steel. It's um, fluted back here. It's all hardened. Um, it's got the ten seventy five sand my. That giant pivot is so cool, too. That that's actually paper micarta. Is that? Oh. God, yeah, it's a simple little material, but but the black on the mm -hmm. blade, the black, you know, the design choice is the black and matches the black, and then the black runs through the back spacer because that's also sand my, and then some titanium for the liners and and the rest of it's all stainless. Who are some of your influences um, in knife making mm -hmm. as you were coming up and kind of figuring out what your style was? Um, a, a big one was WDPs. Um, I don't know if he w, WD. Um, he's a great guy. Um, I years ago he invited me to a shop and I took him up on it. I spent a couple of days there. He taught me a lot of things about making folders. He's a good folder maker. Um, so he was a huge influence. Um, you know, and 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 other people in my life have been great influences. My my grandfather was was kind of my mentor. Um, I remember when I was young and trying to figure out what to do in life. And um, he asked me, well, what, what are you going to do? What, do you, what are you going to do for a living? I was just a kid. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. What do you think I should do? And he looks at me and says, you know, what you really ought to do is you ought to do what you're really good at. Whatever you're good at, that's what you should do. He said, you will enjoy life if you do that. And I, I, I'd love to do this. Ah, uh, that's, that's a cool bit of advice. Cool thing to remember. Um, so the, the, uh, uh, the pocket clip on some of your knives, you have a, a spring pocket clip. Yes. 
Let me see that one for right, a second. There's one right know. here. Yeah. Spring loaded. This is a um, tip up carry in this particular knife, Damascus spring or clip, I mean. And here's another one from this knife. And it's tip down carry, and that's a titanium clip. But I, but I like the spring loaded. I mean, it's it's more work than than the other. But you know, you, I don't think you tear your pocket up with it when you slide this yes. big knife down in your pocket. Yes. It's it's open. And it just drops right in, and when you let go of it, it it holds it in place. Can can you open this one up for us? Okay, that has the California opener on it, right? Yep. This um this knife has a jade. Uh, button lock. Mm. It's a titanium frame. It's got some bronze, ac bronze accents. Uh, this actually is a piece of uh, Tim's Wada Twist Damascus. Tim made that for me years ago, and I decided to put it on this. So this has got just a real light spring on it. If you notice, when I push the button, it's just a yeah. real smooth, real, real easy, real quiet. But once it opens, again. A one hand knife. So, did anyone teach you how to do this, or did you just kind of through your uh, innate expertise with machines and such just kind of figure this all out? Um, I just kind of figured it out on my own uh, experimentation. You know, I would do trials and and try things, and and then if it seemed like it was going to work, I would make a knife out of it. And sometimes the knife got put in the scrap pile. Because they don't always work. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know that's that's innovation. It's it it costs time and effort, but it moves you forward when you do it. So, yeah, this is a this is actually a different push button lock than this knife. They're both push button locks, but internally they're they're actually they're absolutely different. Um, and like I said, I don't know how other people do them. This is just my version of it. Do you work on multiple knives at one time, or are you deeply kind of uh, invested time-wise in one knife until that's done and you're on to the next? I will start, um, if, if I'm confident on the design, and it's not a prototype. If it's a prototype, it's, it's probably going to be one knife. If I'm trying to figure something out that's difficult, I might just do one. But generally, if I've got an idea that I can get through these knives, I'll do two to four at a time. And then I uh, usually the way it seems I've been doing it is I'll get four of them up to where they're heat treated, um, functional, kind of working, but they still have all the finish work to do on the fine fits and you know the handles and all that. Um, at that point, I will probably pick up one at a time and kind of concentrate on it and take it all the way to the end and then go to the next one. Uh, there's definitely efficiencies from doing bad, small batches like that. Mm -hmm. you know, the drill press is set up with this bit. You do it four times, you make it four knives. Um, but but kind of when I get to the finished part, I want to really just concentrate on one knife and get it exactly the way I want it. And a lot of times they'll have different handle materials and, and be four knives, but they're not going to be the same knife. They're going to be different anyway. So as I mentioned up front, I met you at uh, Blade Show 2021, and I know you go to the uh, international uh, custom, what is that, custom cutlery uh, um, uh, exposition. Uh, so is is this how people, um, is this how you get your, your word out and get, I mean, how does it work for a guy like you who's making some really, really fine kind of uh, high-end knives? How how do you approach the market, you know, as opposed to like a Kershaw or someone who, who's who's got airplanes uh, with with advertisements in the sky? Right, right. right. No, I, I personally go to the knife shows. I'm going to the uh, New York Custom Knife Show uh, in Tennessee in November. I'll be at the ICCE, I believe it is, in um, Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, I'm a Knife Makers Guild member. Um, I originally joined the Knife Makers Guild in 1981, and hmm. and they took me back actually just this year. And I'm going to the uh, Blade Atlanta show next year, so that's my show schedule. So um, 
that's really the best place. I mean, people, you know, you can look at knives online all day, but to walk up to a table and put one in your hand and operate it and feel it, and it, it makes a huge difference. Um, I, I do as much as I can on Instagram. Um, I try to put work in progress. People seem to be really interested in that kind of stuff and yeah, what I'm yeah, doing. Yeah. Um, so I have a website. Um, so that's that's kind of my ploy right now is just try to get my stuff out there and be seen. Yeah. Uh, I, so um, at tw- uh, Blade Show 2021, um, by the time I got to your table, I was somewhat fatigued, I have to say. Uh, but your stuff stopped me dead in my tracks. It was very different, you know. I mean, I have uh, I have a book of art knives uh, that are all dazzling and that kind of thing. Um, but I don't know. Something about your knives stopped me. I think I think maybe it was this combination. I mean, and just looking at uh, at the, these scrolling pictures, maybe it's the combination between uh, the sort of practical looking in the in the blade shape especially on your fighter uh but then the materials that draw me in like that uh that mammoth the mammoth ivory um but then when i picked them up and actually started uh you know manipulating them opening them and feeling them um yeah it was kind of like holding a fine watch or something you know you you kind of look at it you're like wow um yeah, I mean <laughs> that's that's about as deep as my conversation Thank can you. get on these kind of knives. No, you, you're welcome, you're welcome. And and like I mentioned before, like um, most of the knives I have, I purport to use and to carry. But at some point, I would like to have uh, a knife like, especially like your fighter in my collection that I actually do carry and maybe cut there a sandwich go. with or whatever. Uh, but but is you know something that. Let me put it this way: No one's ever taken a knife away from me. Okay, so so uh, there should be no reason why I can't walk around with a David Longworth. That's that's correct. And and if you get it scratched up, send it back to me. I'll clean it up for you. You know, they're they're just knives, and um, they they can be sent through a spa and made pretty again if you scratch them up. But they they from me, they're always going to be functional tools. Form follows function. Yeah. That's kind of my mantra. I mean, it has to work right from the beginning. Um, I, I, I design things. I kind of start at the pivot and the lock, and then I design a knife out from that. So that that motion to open and close has to be smooth and precise and tight and all those things. And and then the rest of it's just shape and material. Finish. Uh, what do you hear from your customers? A and B. Do you have do you have like a group of uh, devoted uh, collectors? Um, I don't actually have a group of devoted customers. I'm I'm really getting back into this, oh. uh, getting into it seriously. Like I said, I traveled for years and didn't make knives for years. So I'm I'm the new guy in the block. I've been doing it for 40 years, but I'm still a newbie. Right. I'm walking into this. I realized that when I came, when I decided to, to get serious, build a shop, you know, start doing this very seriously again, I, um, I decided, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the new guy. My 40 years really means nothing. I've got to get my stuff out there. People have to see it and I have to prove myself again. And that's okay. I'm, I'm all right with that. I've done it before. I used to be pretty good. I used to have a uh, you know, I I had customers that would, you know, send me a photo and if it's something new and unique, I will buy it. And, and I just would make a knife and send a picture and they would send me money. I had a, let me tell you a quick story here. I had a, yeah. a, a, a Japanese customer. He was a doctor of dental surgery that liked my stuff and never met him personally. Um, but when he would buy a knife, he had some method. He would put hundred dollar bills and a special envelope and mail them to me. I remember coming home and opening my mailbox on my porch and pulling this envelope out and opening it. And it had hundred dollar bills in it. <laughs> so a bunch of them. You know, I was, he was buying nice stuff. Um, but yeah, today I, I don't really have a big following and, and I'm just, I'm getting started. I'm new. I'm the new that, guy. That, that, okay. So <laughs> 
that that's what these conversations are about are, are meeting people like yourself and finding out more about you but i gotta say i'm totally shocked uh I, um just from your work alone i i assumed that there were there were guys with troves of your of your stuff but uh there will be no doubt no doubt about that um you know just just with oh god especially this one this one keeps getting me this one and the fighter um I'm sorry. The trapezoid and the fighter yeah. are just man. They're they're stunning. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, do you feel any sort of and 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 I hope I'm not projecting onto you my feelings, but um, we were talking about materials before, and and some of them man made, like titanium, not man made, but you know what I mean. Um, but others, uh, like like the mammoth ivory and the gold. Is, is there any sort of uh, spiritual connection to working with that kind of material over working with, say, steel or or or, or a man-made alloy? No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank no, you. No, nothing spiritual. It's um, you know, it's it's the way the metal moves. It's it's what it looks like when you give it a, a you know a twenty-five hundred grit finish. It's how it polishes when you've got a little buffing compound on a rag and you just sit there and just make it sparkle. That's what it's about for me. It's, it's how it feels and what it looks like when, once you're there with it. The vision is there and you make it happen and you just sit back and smile. Um, yeah. That's what it's about. Nothing spiritual at all. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, David, I'm a big old dork. You'll have to forgive me. <laughs> like I look at, I, I look at, uh, the, the mammoth ivory or also stag. I've had some stag in my collection recently and I look at yeah, it yeah. and I'm like, man, it's, it's so beautiful. And it's so, you know, it's obviously just like drawn from the body of some other creature. And one of them, you know, gets sent to us through time, the other uh, much yeah. more recent, but still, uh, something about that to me, I don't know. Uh, and so, yes, I was projecting onto you <laughs> my, <laughs> my dorkiness. No, no, no. You're, you're oh. fine. I, I get your point. <laughs> so what what is your ultimate knife? What would, if, you know, right now, if the David Longworth of this day could project what your ultimate creation would be, do you have any idea what that would be? Uh, probably the next knife I'm working on today. <laughs> um, a actually, I... I would love to to create highly precision knives. Um, I'm not quite there, um, and I'm working hard toward that. It, it, it's it's difficult. Um, let, let me show you what I am working on, just to kind of give you an idea where where I'm headed. So here's here's my next project. Hmm. I don't know how much of that you can see. That's a good angle, yeah. So, um, very slim, titanium frame. Um, I've got two of these going right now. One is a stainless steel blade, and the other is a Damascus twist blade and back spring. Um, so, these are going to have mother of pearl inlaid in here, and these are going to be um, automatics. Oh. So, really small, white. Um, not really a short knife, but um, slim and, and light. There's just not a lot of weight there right now. Yeah. So that's that's kind of where I'm I'm going next. Um, I plan on. I don't know if you've ever seen the, uh, the old Italian switchblades that yeah. that have the lever release on them. Yes. Um, I did a I did some prototyping on that. Oh, and yeah, came up with yeah, the design. Yeah. And um, those are going to have that my my version of that and there's there's a few guys that are doing that and i i look at them but i don't look very hard because i want to do my own thing you know what mm -hmm. i mean mm -hmm. it's just you know, back in the day you couldn't find information you had to go talk to somebody um but today it's everywhere and and to a certain extent i i try not to look at too much of it because i want it to come from me I don't want to get all my ideas from everybody else. And it's, it's hard not to. Right. It really it's is. like you have to avert your eyes almost today. Yes. Yes. A am I allowed to show one of these? Yes. Here? Why not? So th this, this is my, my prototype for, 
for the two I'm working on I just showed you. Um, this has the the old Italian lock release on it. It's yes. spring loaded both ways. So when you flip it up and you push it, best way to show this. Ah, oh, this so cool. Right. So this one is also, I, I did several unique things here um, on this prototype, just, just as experiments. I threw a bunch of stuff at it, actually. This is my rock back lock. Mm -hmm. And you can see how small. So I was talking about making that kind of go away. It's, that's all it is. And, and there's nothing sticking up other than just enough button there to, to release yeah. it. And then when you come around... That uh, locks so cool. and you flip that forward and it's a safety. You can't accidentally make that thing go off. Right. That's, that's one of the things. Yeah. It seems like that retaining spring is pretty stout in both directions, whether it's, uh, whether it's going to actuate or not. It seems like, uh, ah, that's so cool, man. This, this knife will never be finished. Um, there were, there were a couple of technical problems with it. The heat treat kind of messed up on me. Um, I'm going to sit that to the side. I've started a couple others based on what I've learned on that. Um, so that's kind of where I'm going. And, and you, you asked me what I want them to be in the future. I want them to be just as precision, tight, accurate, and just function flawlessly is, is the goal here. Uh, well, two things. First of all, you're now in a state where it's legal to make those, which is great, Ohio. And, and I want to I want to thank those that helped it to get there oh hey I, yeah I that's really do doug ritter Probably and really knife rights and everyone who has who has supported them for sure um the other thing um and this might be an uncomfortable question to wrap up with <laughs> but you're talking about getting as precise as possible but you're also talking about how everything is completely handmade do you feel like at any point you're gonna have to hand off so to speak the handwork to some sort of machine to get the kind of precision you're looking for? Well, I, I mean, I use all kinds of machines. I have, I have, I have a milling machine, right? I have a, a lathe, uh, South Bend lathe that was made in 1942 and used in the second world war. Um, so I use machines all the time, but they're, they're, they're analog. They're old school, right? Mm -hmm. You want to cut a thousandth of an inch, you turn a dial the right amount and, you know, you set the machine up properly and that, that kind of thing. So I, I, I'm constantly using machines. When I say handmade, it's, it's, um, it's not computer made, I guess is uh, yeah, the, bottom, I the bottom line here. You know, if, if something gets cut, I'm, I'm pushing the knob or I'm, I'm pushing gotcha. it into the grinder and, you know, I'm controlling the machine hand cool well uh, okay uh, so that's what i was actually asking okay um, yeah yeah is, is it uh uh yeah computer made over machine made. yeah obviously you use machines but um because you know you know how uh well how it's perceived if you want something with super 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 tight tolerances you gotta give it you gotta give it up to a machine and let it do it but Oh, no, 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 no. That's, that, is, <laughs> that is not true. Good. Um, you know, I've got a lot of respect for the CNC guys. I've, I've done a little code writing myself. Um, but, you know, as, as they cut, the bits change a little bit. And, you know, the first one they cut is a little different than the third one they cut. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you design it correctly, you're, you're going to make a good knife. And there's a lot of good CNC knives out there don't get me wrong i, I love them I, I admire them all but um you know i my my pivots are within a couple of tenths of an inch a couple of ten thousandths of an inch on on accuracy um not tight but just smooth there there's there's a fine line there you know you can get loose and of course it moves really easy you can get too tight and you know, it, it won't function, but there is a fine line when you get it just right. When those two parts are perfectly round and they are smooth and one moves inside the other uh, within a, 
you know, two ten thousandths of an inch, it's it's accurate. That's yeah. that's where I like to go. And and there's varying degrees. You know, my pivots are that tight. Other things can be, you know, five thousandths. It's it's fine. You just got to know where it needs to be accurate, where it's okay to 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 have a little room. It's you know, doesn't all have to be that accurate. Don't get me right, wrong. I, right, I couldn't right. make one if I was going to do that. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, it'd take you forever, right? So yeah. uh, how do how do people who have watched or listened who are interested in your knives, what's the best way for them to find out more about your work, get in touch with you, buy your work? What's the what's the best way? Um, you can see my work on Instagram. Follow me on Instagram. You see what I'm working on today. Uh, you can go to my website, davidlongwoodknives.com, sign up for my newsletter. If you're interested in buying a knife, that's going to be, other than going to a show, um, with that, you would get an email on, on my latest knife on my bench that's ready for sale. I'll send a pictures, descriptions, price, and those people on that newsletter are the first to see it and first opportunity to buy it. Um, so that that's a good way. Sign up on my website for that. Um, go to shows. See me at a show. Pick one up and play with it. I, I, anybody can handle my knives. I don't. You know, I remember years ago I walked up to a, at a knife show as a knife maker. I walked up to a guy's table and said, "Oh, that's pretty. Can I see that?" He said, "I'd rather you don't touch that." <laughs> okay. All right. <sighs> I instantly decided I would never be that guy. Yeah. I won't mention any names, but I would never be that guy. Come to my table. I don't care if you've never touched a knife. I'll show you how to open and close a rock back or a, or a California opener. It's no problem. Cool. Hey, have I heard of this guy? I'm just kidding. No, I don't, I don't know. No, no. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll tell you. <laughs> All right, David. Well, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. I really appreciate it. I think your work is beautiful. And like I said, it stopped me dead in my tracks at blade show 2021 so i'm glad i got a chance to to meet you and find out more about what goes into them well thanks for having me and have a good evening all righty sir take care Bye. the get upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases get upside is an app you put on your smartphone and whenever you need to get gas search your area for savings claim your discount fill up your tank and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone and that's it you've just got cash back Visit the knifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash save on gas. I love the fighter with the mammoth ivory, but I think if I had to take one right away, it would be the trapezoidal knife. That thing is just amazing looking, uh, opened and closed. It is a masterpiece and, uh, it, it feels like you need to be driving around in a cool old 1934, like Chinatown style car. In any case, uh, it was it was great to meet David Longworth. Check out his work, uh, David Longworth Knives, and you can also check him out on Instagram, River Steel Knives, and uh, just check up on the beautiful work he's making. Uh, if you like interviews like this and want to catch other ones every Sunday night here on the knife junkie podcast, uh, we have, we upload a new interview with a knife maker or luminary from the knife world. Of course, every Wednesday is the midweek supplemental show where I get to wax poetic about new knives coming through my collection and new knives out there in the ether. And then also Thursday for Thursday night knives, our live stream where you get to come on and chat knives with me and other guest hosts. So for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I am Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the knife junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at review the podcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.